My name is Govind Singh. Uh, I'm working in Secure System Research Center, which is part of Technology Innovation Institute, uh, which is uh, based out of uh, UAE. And today I will be talking about how we can integrate open source spec compliant UTM adapter or UTM extension in QGC. So this talk will be mainly uh, centered around uh, the outcome we are planning as part of the UTM work group, which has been created uh, almost three months back. And as part of the UTM work group, the main idea is to define the specification of the UTM adapter and then have the implementation on the QGC to start with. So Rishi uh, giving, an, giving an excellent keynote uh, yesterday connects well with this talk. And he has been very instrumental in driving the uh, open UTM ecosystem. And I'm not really sure how many guys, how many of you are familiar with Flight Blender, uh, which is one of the open source uh, UTM service provider uh, implementation based out of the standards and based out of the specifications. So uh, I think the ecosystem is really coming up, I mean, building up and growing. And I think uh, it needs more hands to drive this community in the open UTM space. OK, so following are the high-level outlines of the talk. So we'll start with the UTM background. And then we'll talk about what are the key components in the UTM and why we need UTM adapter. Uh, what is the necessity of having the UTM adapter? And then we'll, talk, we'll have the quick demo on how we are planning to integrate in QGC. And then I'll be uh, touching upon the security aspects. So why security is, is necessary on this use case? Because there are a lot of concerns we have seen while we did the prototyping of the whole use case. So I'll, I'll touch upon those aspects. OK, so to start with, uh, what is UTM? So UTM, or Unmanned Aircraft Traffic Management System, is all about managing the airspace uh, to enable multiple drones that are doing the BDLOS operations. So in short summary, it's a traffic management ecosystem that includes drones, operators, UTM service providers, air navigation service providers, and the regulators. So regulators, essentially the civil aviation authority. So, so if you see, like, I mean, so how it works, so unlike manned aviation where you have ATCs and you have basically pilot and you are having uplink, downlink communication links, so it's all manual way of coordination and the command, right? So UTM ecosystem uses the digital infrastructure, which is nothing but the digital services in terms of APIs. And these APIs are used for communication and control within the whole ecosystem, whatever I just mentioned, all of the actors within the ecosystem. So, okay, so if you see, uh, we have a lot of reference model developed around the UTM. So uh, there are, I, for the simplicity, I have categorized them into three sections. So first reference model is based on the U space, which is mainly for EU. And then second reference model is from NASA, which is mainly for US. And then there is the rest of the regulators. It's a bit fragmented because there are no standard CONOPS defined uh, like we have U space and the NASA CONOPS. So how it works? So typically, I mean, any regulator first uh, defines the acceptable means of compliance, supporting some guidance material that defines the requirement. And then requirement gets translated into the CONOPS, which we call concept of operations. So this is basically the set of requirements which defines each services in the UDM. And now these requirements defined in the CONOPS then gets mapped to the standards. And uh, if you see, I am here highlighted three standards that are available. So we have ASTM at 3411, which is basically for network remote ID. Then we have ASTM 53488, that is USS interoperability. And then we have ED269, that is basically for geo awareness service. So you have to comply to those requirements. I mean, it's not just engineering or software work. You have to really comply those requirements and uh, uh, implement around it. So. In terms of the UTM services, so we can, uh, for the sake of simplicity, we can define into three segments. So first one is the services that are pre-flight, then in-flight, and the post-flight. So in the pre-flight services, we have flight planning, or before that we have e-registration. So 
uh, how you gonna register the operator with the regulators, how you gonna register the serial number of the drone with the regulators. So this is part of the e-registration. Then we have the pre-flight planning, so which is like how you gonna do create a 3D operational volume of your flight plan. And then you have flight authorization, which is the strategic deconflict. Uh, and then you have geo awareness service, which is basically getting the no TAMs or no fly zones uh, whenever you are doing as part of your free pre flight. And once in flight, then you have network remote ID, so which is all about e identification and e tracking of the drone. And there are some advanced services like traffic management, conformance monitoring. So suppose your flight fan is really uh, conforming or it is contingent, non-contingent, all of these states are maintained by the uh, conformance monitoring service. And then we have some uh, advanced services like integration with the ADM, we get the ADSB feed, and if there is an emergency helicopter coming in the low altitude area, so how are you gonna do the uh, you know, uh, safe uh, coordination and obstacle avoidance? So that all comes under the integration with the ADM. Yeah, ATM. And in the post slide, it's more about having the logging infrastructure for audit logs. Suppose if a flight plan was not really conforming, it was in non conformance states. So you need to have some audit log which you can cross check and verify why it was non conforming, what was the reason for the non conformance. And for non repudiation purpose also, you need to audit the logs. So if I have submitted the telemetry to some USSP, uh, and if something happens, so how can I make sure that I really send the telemetry. So that is basically done as part of the non repudiation logging. Okay, so what are the key components in the UTM use case? So we have drone, uh, we have operator, and drone to operator we have command and control link. So typically that can be done using um, typical radio controllers, or you can have Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, cellular based radio, or you can even have software defined radios. These are basically long range radios available of, uh, you know, commercially of the self. I'm not really sure if you have heard of uh, Doodle Labs, DTC, Silvers. These are some of the key long range radio options you can integrate with your uh, flight and mission planning. And then on the GCS operator side, you need a client side implementation which basically talks to the UTM service provider stack. So this is where you have the, um, uh, the UTM adapter comes, in, comes into the picture. On the right side, you have the uh, UTM service provider stack and then you can have multiple USSPs which will be doing real-time discovery and synchronization. And how you do, you do it via InterUSS, which is one of the open source project in Linux Foundation that is basically meant for discovery and synchronization. So between two USSP, you will have an InterUSS instance that will be making sure whatever airspace awareness they have, they will be sharing all of these information on real-time. And then we have UTM to uh, you know ATM adapter or bridge to get the ADSB feed uh, so that we can know what is happening and the higher altitude of something is uh, emergency uh, that is coming in the lower altitude we can get those alerts. So in terms of the uh, use case, so we have on the GCS side we can have a proprietary GCS, proprietary ground control station software, or we can have Ardu Mission Planner uh, like one of the open source or Q ground control, or it can be other variant of the ground control stations that can be used to uh, interface with the uh, UTM flight and mission. So what are the key components on the U uh, on the USSP side, on the uh, UTM service provider side? So it has a backend component, uh, which is basically implementing all the UTM services, which I just explained uh, previously. And then it has an front-end component, which basically shows the visualization of the airspace that the uh, USP is handling. And then there is an authorization server that is mainly implementing the OpenID Connect for authentication and authorization so that on the GCS side, you basically first authenticate with the system as part of the security uh, architecture and you get the authorization token. So once you have the auth token, then only you can access the resources on the back end or you can access the API at the back end for flight planning, network remote ID based on the validity of the token. And if it is expired, you can't really access. I mean, it's basically tied up with the token validity and the scope. Okay, so with this uh, understanding, let's try to understand why we need UTM adapter. So as of now, we have standards that are talking about UTM services, how these UTM services has to be implemented, what are the key requirements, what are the data format, but the standard is not really defining 
what should be the interface from a ground control station to the USB. So due to this, we have a lot of fragmentation. So uh, if I want to integrate with AirMap, you had one implementation of AirMap where standards were not even formed. And that is what a dead code and recently as part of the cleanup that has been removed. So how are we gonna scale up with when the UTM is really going to happen, right? So we need some kind of interface to be defined on the uh, GCS to the USB side. So the whole idea of UTM adapter is to define a configurable adapter based out of standards. So it's not engineering work, it has to comply standards. So you have to define the interfaces based out of the standard and then use them as an adapter that can interop with any USSP. So it should work with any UTM service provider, provided they are implementing the standards. So that is the motivation. And I hope like it, uh, it connects well with the, the whole open standard uh, ecosystem. Uh, so I'll just quickly walk through uh, to the API interfaces, what we have in the current specification. So you can see there is, we have a project, uh, I mean, we have a GitHub project in drone code GitHub project. And then here we have, uh, uh, you know, UTM adapter project. And you can see first we have the product.json which talks about the services supported by that, uh, you know, current specification of the UTM adapter. Then there is a UTM adapter.yml which basically specifies the specification of each APIs. So you can see that we have a endpoint for getting the capability of the service. So it's based out it's based on which version of standard you are supporting. And then you basically negotiate the capability and based on that you follow the specific standard. If suppose I'm using AS, ASTM F3411 19 versus 22A. So that kind of differentiation can happen with respect to that. And then you can use some interactive way to see the JSON format of the e-service. So this can be uh, seen. I mean, you can just download the uh, UTM adapter.yml and just load it and just have a look at it. Okay, so this is the high-level system architecture, so I hope you have the basic understanding of what we are trying to do with UTM adapter. So uh, as part of the overall system architecture, we're gonna have one toolbar, which allows you to add the credential, which will be used for authentication and authorization with the UTM service provider that will use the OpenID Connect and OAuth 2.0 spec. And once you do that, then you get the authorization token, access token, and after that, you can do your flight and mission planning. You can create your 3D operational volume. You can submit your uh, flight plan, provided you have the access token, and you can uh, do the network remote ID submission. So this is the high-level system architecture. Please, I mean, you can check it offline because these slides will be available later. And this is the high-level flight authorization fl uh, flow. Uh, so we have a US USSP flight authorization class. This is basically implementing the uh, one abstract class, which is the USSP service controller. And that is basically being used to populate all the flight planning information, like your 3D operational volume, the start time, end date of the flight, your relative altitude, and other required information in terms of the drone serial number or your operator ID. Everything can be handled with this interface. And once you submit your flight plan, so your flight plan goes into the submitted state, then there is a discovery synchronization happens at the uh, inter-USS and USSP level, and based on that, your flight plan can be rejected or it can be approved. If it is approved, then it goes to the activated state, and once it is activated, then basically you can fly. And you have these state machine that basically do the UI transition. And similarly for the telemetry flow, you have the same concept for the flight planning. Once your flight plan go, goes into the activated state, then your network remote ID starts. So the spec tells you need to submit three hertz. It means every network remote ID sample should go in every three seconds. So, so this is uh, as per the specification. So now we have two setups. So we have the simulation setup as well as uh, we have the complete integration with the real environment. So in the simulation setup, it's very simple. So we are using Gazebo uh, Mavlink uh, interface. Uh, and then we are using the PX4 Citadel firmware. And then we have the QGC with the UTM adapter. And then we have a you know, cloud instance of the Flight Blender, or it can be even hosted locally. You can, use, you can just use the Docker container as a local host to try out at your developer at the development level, but it can be, it can use the cloud instance of the uh, Flight Blender to test the whole use case. And 
later we can customize and add as and when the spec defines more functionality. So uh, I will quickly uh, go through the demo, how it has been implemented as part of the first phase. So uh, we have a drone. Uh, so this is the QCC uh, toolbar. So we have the USSP toolbar, and uh, we give the client credential, uh, uh, and then we basically uh, do the login and do the open ID connect and authorization, and we get the access token. So you see that the icon go, got green because the token is valid. Then you add the waypoint for your flight plan, and you can basically create the 3D operational volume as an automatic geofence or manual geofence. So this is where we create, so this, this functionality is how you create the 3D operational volume. And then you give your start date, end date of the flight, and then you give the uh, altitude. So as of now, we are giving the min-max altitude, uh, but again, it can be done relative. I was having few discussion with uh, Hala Sky, so that can be done. So now we got the uh, flight, uh, uh, you know, it got approved, but still not activated because the, the flight time is not yet lapsed. So we still have 22 seconds because the start time starts a bit later, after 22 seconds. So the, you cannot really activate the mission because you are not supposed to fly now. You are supposed to fly after three seconds. So uh, now you can upload the mission. Now the takeoff starts. So this is a UKM approved flight. And now the the flight will take off, and then network remote ID submission. So every three seconds, one network remote ID samples goes to the USSP. And uh, for the simplicity, I have shown here some of the logs, which shows the telemetry is getting submitted. Again, it is based on the ASTM F3411, completely complying the standards. OK, so we understood the overall use case, how we are doing flight and mission using uh, UTM adapter in QGC context. Now let's talk about the challenges. So we know what is remote ID. I mean, so there are in FAA in US, the mandate is to use the broadcast remote ID. And somehow it got delayed. It was supposed to be mandated, but it got deferred by in three months. So broadcast remote ID is nothing but broadcasting the drone identity and the drone location, as well as operator location uh, broadcasting. So there will be an observer who will be re receiving the information and checking whether the operator ID is valid or not, whether the drone ID, which is the drone serial number, whether it is valid or not. But the current problem is, uh, or the challenge, because we have done the prototyping, what we see is the current state of art using Wi-Fi and Bluetooth as a medium to transmit. So if you see Wi-Fi, the way it's being used is Wi-Fi is having the beacon frame. So every beacon, you basically, the payload of the direct remote ID, you encapsulate inside the vendor IE of the beacon. And now it's unassociated link, it's going in the plain text. So if I run a sniffer, I can see the operator ID, I can see the, I mean, um, the lat long of the drone, I can see lat long of the operator. So there is no privacy I mean, maintained. It is completely a cybersecurity flaw. Uh, unless we do proper signing, we put proper L2 encryption, and plus, the other main challenge is Wi-Fi and Bluetooth doesn't really work well in a dense environment. So suppose if it is crowded, congested, 2.4 gigahertz, then definitely you're going to have a lot of beacon miss. How are you going to make making sure that you are receiving, you will receive that reliability? So this is a reliability concern. And apart from that, it has limited range. So uh, again, you cannot hardly have more than few, few hundred meters, not more than few hundred meters. So if you need to really have Better coverage on Wi-Fi, you need better antenna, you need to tweak the physical layer of the Wi-Fi. And same goes for the Bluetooth. If you use Bluetooth 5.1 or 5.2 spec, it doesn't give more than 500 meters or one kilometer. Even though the physical layer claims, but that is the ideal condition. And uh, so range is the issue, and the privacy and the security, which I already highlighted. So these are the key concerns with the direct remote ideas of now. However, there are some working groups. So in IETF, there is a working group, which is DRIP, that is trying to solve some of the privacy concern by um, suggesting some lightweight encryption, which can be used for signing those messages, as well as, uh, you know, so apart from that, uh, they are trying to have some more reliability around uh, this whole use case. So in terms of network remote ID, so network remote ID's concept is same, uh, but instead of broadcast, you are using a 
always on network capability where you have always the network backhaul, the internet connectivity, so that you are directly submitting to the USSP or the USP. It is using LTE or like 3G, 4G, 5G or beyond technologies. But there are also challenges because we have done prototyping with the network remote ID. So we have our own network remote ID module with uh, NB-IoT as well as the LTE CAT4 modem. Now what are the challenges? So if you see the, unlike a terrestrial UE, so I have a phone, I'm connected to a base station. So the way I am not having the direct line of sight with the base station, so what I see is a bit more uh, less receive signal strength. But when you have a drone at the higher altitude, so you have a direct line of sight with the base station, so you have a better signal strength, better RSI, that is desired. However, due to more height, you are actually receiving the adjacent cells uh, and it is creating the interference. And due to this, your signal to noise ratio impacts. So your signal to noise ratio deteriorates. So this is one of the concerns with, with respect to the quality of service. So plus, uh, the way you receive the signal is via the side loads. So you are not using the primary loads because you are at the higher altitude. And due to this, there is a uh, fragmentation in the cell association. So you will see there is a frequent disconnect. So we did few trials and we saw like there was send, uh, a lot of roaming that was triggering where you are not even moving, uh, not, not even going from one cell to another cell. But this phenomena is due to the scattering and the antenna side lobe. And there is a lot of uh, literature available around this problem statement. So these are the concerns with respect to the performance, but the main cybersecurity risk is uh, you can downgrade. So uh, there was a talk in Black Hat 2019, which talks about all LT module can be hacked. And literally, I mean, you can go, I mean, you can check the talk. I mean, so the main thing is uh, if you don't harden your LT stack, you can always downgrade to 2G. And 2G, there are a hell out of vulnerabilities where you can exploit those and do a lot of denial of service attacks. You can do replay attacks. So you can basically replay, modify data and replay the data. So that is really concern. So this needs uh, more attention. So there are uh, 3GPP or GSMA acknowledges some of these concerns and they actually are working on uh, solving some of, or mitigating some of these uh, things. So uh, we created a high-level UTM threat model. So we can have a UTM threat model of the UTM case, a UTM use case by uh, using some standard threat modeling methodology. So uh, I'm not really sure Stride, how many of you have heard of Stride. So this is one of the threat modeling uh, methodology where you define your threats based on assets, and then you try to see what are the mitigation you can have around those threats. So if you uh, see the UTM services, so we have an e-registration service, so we can have a thread which is like unauthorized registration of the drone, where somebody is basically unauthorized and he has the access to the registry data and it is basically tampering the registry data. Flight planning, so somebody can basically intercept and modify the flight plan by man in the middle. Or e-identification when you are submitting the network remote ID. So the same goes like how you are making sure your uh, network remote ID is not really getting tampered or altered by man in the middle. Uh, same goes for the geofence. And now if you see on the tracker side, so if you see there are a lot of discrete tracker devices available as of now which are implementing this broadcast and uh, network remote ID. So the cyber security are those really uh, solving all the you know physical layer tampering or you know the way they are upgrading the firmware or the OT upgrade are those secure enough? Are they implementing the secure boot? So or do they have a hardware security module for storing the uh, you know private keys? So all of these things or or, or like this, uh, how the certificate key management is done. So all of these are uh, defined in the threat model. So you can have, have a look uh, offline. So. In nutshell, we have the challenges around this use case, which talks about the remote identification, authenticity and integrity, operator privacy, remote identification ambiguity, denial of service attacks, and whatever the tracker device that are available are those really temp resilience, and then the communication resilience. So communication resilience in the sense when you are roaming from 
uh, or when you have uh, you know a lot of uh, you can say jamming a lot of interference how you are making sure your network remote id is submitted or how you are making sure you have a uh, way to get the uh, you know uh, traffic alerts way to get the uh, traffic uh, monitoring alerts weather information all of the means that is required at the real time so with this concept so we actually uh, prototype a concept called udm trusted flight so what is udm trusted flight so it is a concept to verify the permission artifacts that are coming from the usp and validating at the drone not on the gcs so it's more like we basically submit the flight plan uh, as part of the flight planning the flight authorization we get the permission artifacts permission artifacts contains the uh, certificate which contains the public key as well as the access token now the whole part you validate in the drone not on the so that you know and you basically trigger this logic with the uh, pre flight check so when you do uh, flight planning so you have the pre flight check implemented on the px4 firmware side today it does it doesn't it's just the placeholder uh, in terms of the utm context so the idea is to do this permission artifact validation on the px4 firmware stack as part of the pre flight check to make sure this is a trusted flight in utm context so the idea is we want to make it a bit more robust uh, because we want to basically do the flight planning signing from the drone side so in that case we need a hardware security module where we can generate the key and basically then maybe the hash of the flight plan can be signed and before we send the uh, initiate the flight authorization and as part of the response we basically validate the permission artifacts on the drone side so so this is one of the concept uh, because this is not there in the spec but this is something we want to have as in readiness or as in uh, a kind of prototype and influence if these kind of concept can be adopted in the specification so so that can be done as part of the ASTM as part of the gutma or there are a lot of ecosystem which can help to uh, accelerate uh, or mitigate or whatever the threats we have so with this i would like to conclude and just uh, give you some direction to the future work so uh why we need udm adapter in qgc is for interoperability open source easy to use and it's portable so uh, we, we don't want to have multiple udm extension for multiple ussp and then once we have the basic services implemented and uh, the next phase the plan is to have the uh, uh, traffic management service as well as the conformance management service and then later we think of adding the security extension like sign flight plan sign telemetry utm trusted flight and try to see if we can do some communication resiliency aspects on the px4 side uh, in the hardware infrastructure point of view so with this uh, i conclude my talk and for any discussion please reach out to me uh, on this email id and please join uh, you know uh, drone utm adapter working group for more Uh, deeper discussions so as of now uh, rishi is leading the work group uh, hala sky and tii are participating and working uh, together to help and accelerate what we can do in this ecosystem and along with the security extension thank you now i'm open for questions Thank you. Um, yeah, please. Yeah, just you mentioned Europe and the United States. How do you see UTM happening outside of those regions? Like, do you just cover trends? What more important thing to do? So, in EU, especially, the EU space is the base reference model that is going to be a base, uh, for, you know, defined by the ESA and uh, I mean Eurocontrol. So that's that's basically for the EU. Uh, and us it's nasa based uh, and which is like fa and nasa working together to have uh, uh, this model but there are other uh, for example i give example of india so they are having a different kind of implementations or like previously there is something called digital sky uh, that was trying to implement few con offs then there is a no permission no take off that was uh, one of the so like that there will be some derivative that will be uh, 
that will adopt some of the main concepts that are defined in the these two main uh, uh, conops. But again, there will be derivative, and be, because that will be there, some countries may have their own specific needs. Uh, they need to tune it, and based on that, there will be some IC. There will be some derivative uh, stuff. But still, the main foundation is every uh, regulator need to define the uh, concept of operation, clear requirements of how they want to have the UTM implementation. So. <laughs> Um, okay, good question. So, if you see, mostly you are giving back the data. Okay. So now, uh, it, the current implementation as part of the flight planning uh, and the network remote ID, it's just like authorizing you are the uh, 3D operational volume and network remote ID. You are sending the drone and operator location as well as along with the identity. But when you have uh, another services, for example, traffic. Uh, uh, monitoring service or conformance monitoring service. So you will be getting the notification back to QGC so that operator can basically do the decision making. So for example, you will get the real time airspace uh, awareness you will have. So suppose in between some emergency helicopter comes in your flight plan, then you need some way to get notified. So those kind of alerts will be coming and then accordingly, uh, the operator has to take decision or the, it, the, there can be replanning of your flight plan. So your whole waypoint or the flight plan can be overridden with a new plan because of the new uh, alert. So that's all is defined in the spec. So it's all about like how you implement and some of the things are not precisely defined in the spec so you can interpret differently and accordingly the implementation may vary. Thank you.